When you look at the book of Lamentations, it's easy to see just by, by its name that you have someone lamenting over something or someone. In this case, you have the prophet by the name of Jeremiah that he looks over the nation of Israel and he sees her wandering further and further away from God. The entire book of Jeremiah, in which he penned by inspiration, was for an encouragement to speak where God has told him to speak, to bring them up with great encouragement, to see that they do have the strength to overcome and not to play the part in their hand of a spiritual adultery. But at the same time, when you see the book of Lamentations open, he's lamenting over their condition because it seems as though there's no turning back for this group. By the time you come to chapter 5, while the chapter itself has an overtone of lamenting, it's really more of a prayer. As a fact, as Jeremiah is interceding for these individuals, these individuals who have turned their back on God, they turn their back on God because of the discouragement, perhaps of the nations around them, because of those individuals who were seeking out and doing those things which are evil, but yet they're still prospering. And even within the own, his own congregation or the idea within the nation of Israel that there was a lot of negative overtones in everything that he would come and say to them about God and what God was trying to do for them. And because of this discouragement, he goes before God and he says, basically, our joy has run out. As a matter of fact, our dancing or our reasons to rejoice, our uh, ability to celebrate our relationship with God, well, that's just basically turned into a mournful sorrow for which we have no answers. Our crown, a representation here of an identity that would allow them to be recognized by God. Our crown has fallen from our head. And because of that, he comes to the conclusion, we have sinned. Jeremiah includes himself as a part of this sin-sick nation. But at the same time, he continues on through the chapters in trying to continue on to this particular chapter and trying to encourage those people, even in this darkest of times, there's a way to overcome. There's a way to overcome discouragement. There's a way to overcome the negativity. There's a way to overcome the despair and even the tragedy in which they might be facing. The Bible tells us a lot about discouragement, and we understand that this is one of the devil's greatest tools that he can use. You get a child of God discouraged, and you'll win him over. The idea that that's why Paul would even tell the church at Galatia, that he would tell them, let us not be weary in well-doing. We shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6 and verse number 9. But think about it. Paul put a condition upon their reaping. If we faint not. The idea of fainting there is discouragement. The idea of being overwhelmed with the things that, that are going wrong and not looking for the true blessings that God has delivered through his son Jesus Christ. You and I both know that there are many books that have been written just from the secular sense of how one overcomes discouragement. And all of them probably have some good within them. And there's some that are even considered great because they're based upon biblical principles. This afternoon, for the time that we have, let's study this idea of overcoming overcoming discouragement in a way of being uplifted, 
a way of being able to be strengthened and understand really what it means to overcome the world as the way God has described it. The first thing that we need to remember in this remedy, if you will, of over to come, overcoming discouragement is to recognize who we are. The idea is if we truly understand who we are as the children of God, then our focus will be on heaven. Our focus has to be on heaven. When you stop and think about this life and a life without our Father, a life without God would certainly be meaningless. That's why Solomon would write that vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and verse number 2. When you think as what he's describing here, he's opening this book as he's looking to the generation that will come after him, that Solomon would look at that generation face to face and tell them, if you're looking at the world to be your focus, if you're looking at the world to be your encouragement, if you're looking at the world to be your reward, you're looking at an empty place. You're looking at a place that's absolutely worthless in the end. The Bible tells us that this world and all of its material possessions one day is going to melt with a fervent heat. It's no longer going to be in existence. And thinking about that being gone, that being temporary, then there's only one hope for the child of God. And it's certainly not here. Paul told the church at Ephesus, he says that at that time, ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12. The idea that these Gentiles as they were reflecting back upon the history of the Jews. And Paul is coming to tell them that now there's a better covenant and understanding that both Jew and Gentile can have the salvation that's through the power of the gospel and having these things within their very hand. He says, look how far you've come. He says, you were once without God. But not now. Not now through your faith and obedience to God and your continued faithful living to God. That's why he would write to the church at Ephesus to show them how important the church was for them to continue to overcome the world, to overcome the negativity, to overcome the discouragement, to overcome the drama that may be associated with everything that's temporary. But see... With God, heaven is reality. I don't know how much you think about heaven. I think a lot of times heaven is right here in our face, maybe when we suffer a loss. Maybe it can be someone that we're just acquainted with. Maybe it's someone that we're actually very close to. And so when that happens, we begin to look beyond this world and our minds just naturally think about what's after this world. What is it that I'm going to see? Now, the world will tell you that there's nothing. But God says there's everything. That's why Jesus said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, verses 20 and 21. We quote that passage and think about the idea of that Sermon on the Mount, that that great multitude that's by the seashore there as Jesus is, is looking back up toward the mountain and that he's able to reflect or re, to, to, to reflect his voice going through far and wide, that these individuals needed to hear that God has something in store for them. They needed to look beyond 
this present world. They needed to look beyond just the co-inhabitants of associations, but actually look upon the idea of one day living with God, their creator. You know, when one studies Genesis chapters 1 and 2, he, he's introduced to the entirety of the creation and the fact in how God did everything in order to give us life and not only to give us life, but to sustain this life. By the time you get to chapter number three, you have the promise of God that he's going to send his son and he is going to deliver a, such a crushing blow to the head of Satan that it will allow you and I to overcome anything that may be in front of us. Anything that would keep us held back from one day living with God. The Apostle John said it this way, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are past Away, Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. I don't know of anyone who's never suffered physical pain. To be honest with you, I've never met anyone that's not suffered some sort of emotional pain. I don't know if I've ever met anyone who has never suffered a loss as far as maybe someone close to them dying. I remember the very first time that I ever experienced that personally. And I thought the world had come to an end. The world that I knew, that, that an individual who was so big and so strong so knowledgeable, so comforting and compassionate, someone who had such an influence and an absolute just persona, just about his personal being, that there was no one that I ever knew that was not encouraged or influenced in the positive way by this man, and yet he succumbed to sickness and he passed from this life I remember telling people I don't know what I would do if I lost my parents you know we've never lived without our mothers and our fathers that's a completely different type of loss and when you stop and you begin to look at a loss such as that and, and, and how that can literally stop you where you are. How does one get over that? He gets over that simply because God's living in heaven and he says, I want you to come live with me. Why? Because I don't want you to suffer any more pain physically or emotionally. I don't want you to suffer any more death, separation, because we'll never be apart again. And everyone that's there with you, you'll never be separated from them again either. He said, I don't want you to worry your little eyes about this anymore because I'm going to make sure all the tears are wiped away. I don't want you to have to worry about anything because I'm going to take all the sorrow and I'm going to put it in its proper place. God has given us a reason to focus on something of which sometimes we can't even comprehend. That's why it takes a lifetime to focus on it. 
and to overcome any kind of discouragement that may be holding us back from doing the good things that we know that we can do, our focus must be, must be on heaven. And secondly, in order to overcome discouragement, we must learn how to count our blessings. We have to learn how to count our blessings. We cannot allow just the few negative things in life to control us. We sing that song, don't we? Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Uh, one of the counseling methods I learned in, in, in studying, uh, not only in group counseling, but also studying in personal counseling, that you would take a, a sheet of paper. And this is something that, that anyone can do just on a daily basis. It's actually a therapeutic in a way. It doesn't solve your problems, but it helps you to look at them in a way that's positive. You're, one side of the paper, you write down all of the things that you can control, and then on the other side of the paper, you write all of the things that are out of your control. And once you finish listing those things, then you tear that piece of paper in half, and you take all of those things that are out of your control, and you get rid of them. Sounds so simple. It sounds ineffective. But in so many ways, it can be so positive. Because what's left are all the things within your control. I remember playing sports. I remember playing in a particular game and played a pretty decent game, I thought, in, in my mind. And Parents were cheering from behind the screen. Players were coming up and patting you on the back. And then just that one individual said something that wasn't so positive. And yet the focus is right there. But if an individual can take that and count all of the positive things, can count all the blessings that are attached with whatever we were doing, well, his mind would be occupied and his concentration would be on what should be right. That's the same thing with the Word of God. When you think about all the negative things that are in this world, you and I, we start writing down our blessings. We count them one by one. And I don't know of anyone who's ever gotten to a certain number and just stopped. Maybe they got to a certain number and stopped because they were tired, but not because they ever ran out of blessings. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 17 that every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Now listen to him. With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Uh, we oftentimes quote the first part of that verse that uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from God. And that's true. He says, with whom there's no variableness. The idea is that God never changes. He still continues to desire to pour out his blessings upon us every single day. And the idea of neither shadow of turning, that God's never going to change his mind about that. The blessings will still come, and you and I should be busy counting because they'll always be more than what you and I can count. If Christ our Lord will always have if we're following Jesus as our example, then you and I know that there's going to be more good in this life than there will be in bad. If you go all the way back to Acts chapter 16, where you've got Paul in jail, 
And there Paul and Silas are, 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 are bound, both at the wrist and at the feet. And the Bible says, And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feast fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Acts 16, verses 23 through 25. The idea that, that with them being chained in the innermost part of the prison, some scholars say that, that in there, there was no no light whatsoever. It would be almost like solitary confinement. The only thing that would be noticeable is what the other prisoners could hear, not what they could see. And so here they are in prison in stocks. Maybe even their lives are at stake after the beating in which they took And they chose to count their blessings by singing praises unto God. You ever felt, faced a difficulty in life? How many times you just set out in song? You know, isn't it amazing how emotional music can be? Uh, just think about it from the secular standpoint. Uh, don't you have, uh, you runners, and uh, I heard about you guys. I, I, I've never been with you. But you, you, have these, uh, you have these tracks on your phone, right? That, that you only play these when you're setting out to run. And, and you know, you're not playing um, uh, a sad song, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you play that after the run. I don't know. But, but the idea is it, it, there's so much emotion tied up into it that it, it, it actually motivates your mind and your mind motivates your body. It's no different. That's why we see music all throughout the Old and the New Testament because there's things that God wants us to remember and that we begin to sing praises to God and we sing them even in the most difficult times because it allows us to be reminded of the blessings that we count one by one and finally the way to overcome discouragement feeling down being in despair is we have to remember the idea of the memory that God has allowed us to have is one of the greatest blessings that you and I will ever be given this side of heaven. And with that memory, you and I can understand and know the end of the story. You and I know that Jesus is one day he is going to return. You and I know and we understand that he is going to deliver the faithful up to the Father. You and I know and we understand that Jesus' mission here upon this life was to make this possible so that he could return and allow us to live with him in heaven. That's why John wrote, and they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. Revelation 12 and verse 11. They love not their lives. They didn't love this present world. But rather they love God. In order to endure and persevere through whatever this life may give them. John went on to say, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me. Right blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14 and verse 13. I know and I understand 
that a lot of times when we think about heaven again, we associate it with death. That's hard to bring a smile to our faces. But when you remember even Song of Sol- or uh, the wise man Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the idea of it's better to go into the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Why, Solomon? Because he said that our minds can reflect upon what's in the future. We don't have to think about death in the way that does not bring comfort, but we can think of it in a way that brings us victory. We know that we will attain the mountaintops, and if that be the case, then why worry? Why be overcome? Why be discouraged? If this is everything that God is offering, then when discouragement comes our way, just remember heaven's at stake. Remember to count your blessings. And remember you know the end of the story. And knowing those three things, you and I can overcome. Just like Jesus, when he came, overcame this world in order to give you the opportunity of victory in him. This afternoon, if you're not a child of God, the victory in Christ Jesus is waiting for you. In the sense that you can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can be baptized into Christ where all the spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1 and verse number 3. To get into Christ one must be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. The candidate to do that must repent of his sins. Change his mind about his old way of life. And looking forward to being the new creation that's in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 17, it may be that I'm speaking to a child of God. Maybe that you're discouraged. Maybe Satan has overcome you. The fact is that you don't know where to turn. Turn toward heaven. Start counting your blessings. And one of those blessings is the fact that God is allowed today to stand. So you don't have to live in torment any longer. Just remember. You know how it will end. Won't you come as together we stand and sing.